and welcome to Spy Hearts Podcast, where your hosts go deep undercover into the world of spy movies to decipher which films make the knock list. But remember, this information is strictly for your ears only. I'm Agent Scott. And I'm Cam the Provocateur. And Cam, I believe we have another spy podcaster descending from the rafters to join us today. <laughs> That's right. Uh, we have Christian from the Spy Fi Guys. Christian, hello. Hello. Yes, good to be on here. Uh, we, we thought we'd give you a, a Mission Impossible intro. Would you prefer like a James Bond getting shot from a torpedo or something like that? Or... I mean, I'm good with the descent. Like, uh, so Mission Impossible, the first one, was my very first spy movie. So I think it's only appropriate. Oh, wow. Okay, oh, yeah. Wow. Your first spy movie that you ever saw. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Um, and that's also like my first, the first PG-13 movie I ever saw. <laughs> I think I was, what, let's see, 11 or, no, wait, when, when did, 96. So yeah, I was 11 when it came out, when it came out. And yeah, I don't think I'd seen any other spy movie before. I think I'd seen bits and pieces of Bond, but not like the full movie. And so that really, I mean, the fact that I posted a spy podcast tells you what kind of impact that had on my life hmm. well i suppose that's a, a good jumping off point uh before we talk about the spy fi guys and, and and your podcast um mission impossible sounds like your first spy film but what are some of your other favorites i mean i do love the bond films uh the brosnan era is you know what i grew up during and so i actually have a funny story about when i got into bond it was actually when i was in japan as an exchange student and, you know, I was at, you know, a school, so I had to wear a uniform. That's where I first learned how to tie a tie. And, you know, in this little village, everyone, you know, goes around on bikes, so all, at least all the students. So I'm wearing, I'm wearing a, basically a suit, and I had sunglasses and headphones on, and I'm riding my bike around town. And, like, most of my classmates were like, you look like James Bond when you do like, Oh, I like the sound of that. And hmm, I've never actually seen those movies. I should do that. So I like watched all the Brosnans and then some of the Conneries while I was in Japan and then just dove right into it. Did you for some reason start carrying a martini whilst riding the bike just to sort of add to the end? <laughs> oh, if only. No, no. <laughs> so if you're introduced to the Brosnan, you know, Bond films mm -hmm. first, do you consider him to be your James Bond? Oh, that's a good question um uh, you know it's like picking your children and i don't have any children but i it's really hard for me to say who my bond is like yeah i i know brosnan was the first i saw but then i saw the conneries and and then like i would get basically i would go into these phases of i just get progressively start watching each one's filmography and like just re you know, start identifying with that one it's like so I can't choose. It's really hard for me to choose. Like I think <laughs> Connery is up there. A Craig, like after basically, you know, when there was that gap between what two thousand two and two thousand six, I started reading all the Fleming novels, and so you know, especially with Casino Royale, Craig really filled that void for me. Of you know, all right, someone who's a bit closer to the books that you know, well, since we don't have any more Timothy Dalton films, mm. so yeah, it's it's hard for me to choose. <laughs> It is a tough one. I, I, I try and whenever I get asked that question, if I'm on another podcast or, uh, you know, Cam just incessantly texting me about it. <laughs> um, I will always say that I think Sean Connery is the best Bond. Mm -hmm. And Pierce Brosnan is my Bond because of when I got into Bond. I was the same as you. I'm a, I'm a golden eye baby. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and he was a guy I, I saw in the cinema first. Yeah. It's a, I'm ashamed to say that the first one I saw in cinema was Die Another Day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my first was GoldenEye in theater. So, oh, see, uh, that's a better experience. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm spoiled. I'm spoiled. I, I'm curious, though, beyond Bond and Mission Impossible, what are some other spy films that have come across your radar that you've really loved? I mean, I've seen all of the Bournes, obviously. I've, seen, I've gone back and seen some other stuff like uh, Spy Who Came In From The Cold, which I'm going to bring up a bit when we get into that into the movie mm. um other than that i most things unless they're you know pretty much unheard of like this movie <laughs> <laughs> okay so we've given the origin story of spy hearts in the past on the podcast how did spy fi guys happen so uh it's hosted by me and my good friend zach and i think we were just thinking well you know we're a bunch of nerds and we 
talk about stuff all the time. And we we're like, we basically, just, you know, I've guessed it on uh, other podcasts before we started our own podcast. And I just realized, you know what, this could be a fun thing to do. And we just started thinking about, all right, what are things we both like? We both love Star Wars. Oh, well, there's a billion Star Wars podcasts out there. Same with Star Trek. Um, but, you know, there's a, you know, there's, there's a few really good James Bond podcasts out there, but I think I'm more into Bond than he is. And as, or as well as like Mission Impossible, there's a number of good ones out there. So what we really came down to is like, all right, you know, what I've noticed is there's a lot of podcasts about more, you know, strictly about spy movies, but there's nothing that covers both spy fact and spy fiction. And that's where we get our catchphrase, spy fact, spy fiction, and everything in between. So what we do, with the exception of our upcoming summer series, is that we alternate every week, or every every episode, rather, whether we're going to be talking about something that's based completely in fiction or based at least somewhat in reality. Oh, interesting, interesting. So when you talk about reality, you're also talking about the, uh, the Fast and Furious films, I assume. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, although at, at, I guess what point? It's about, what, seven or so? That's when they start becoming spies. So that's up for grabs, really. <laughs> Yeah, I found it to be, I think, around number six, I think. So oh, you only good. get, right. it's like three mission, or sorry, three uh, Fast and Furious movies are applicable to the spy genre. <laughs> uh, it, it's a very unwieldy franchise, you know, kind of like Cars. It's like Cars 2 is a total spy <laughs> movie, but Cars 1 and one and 3 are not. Have you have you guys covered Cars 2 yet? No, we haven't yet, no. <laughs> it's, it's in, it's in oh. the tube. It's going to happen at oh, some man. point. It's going to happen. Because I will say... I have, I actually enjoyed that movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see who wins the race to Cars 2 between uh, Spy Hards and Spy Fi Guys. <laughs> I don't think I could get convinced my co-host to get good on that, on board with that, but we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, this will not be a fast race. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we just, uh, we started recording, I think actually we started recording before the pandemic, but uh, once everything got locked down, we realized, all right, you know, we now we actually have time to figure out, oh, how are we going to host this? Where, how are we going to set up the website and everything else? So even though we started recording before the pandemic, we started releasing actually a little over a year ago now. Now, so we're come, we actually just passed our one year anniversary. Mm-hmm. Congratulations! Thank you, thank you. You, it's interesting hearing the, the genesis and the sort of thought processes you both went through because it's exactly the same thing me and Cam did. <laughs> Very similar. Yeah. Yeah. Great minds think alike. Um, but uh, so I suppose I will ask a couple of quick questions yeah. in, in the Spy Fi Guys realm. Um, what's been your favorite movie to cover so far? Hmm, fa- well, let's see. Because there goes two ways. Because I think, you know, we've had movies that we really enjoyed but you know maybe not the best podcasting because it's you know we're all we're very much in agreement oh this was great this was so great mm-hmm. whereas i think the most fun episodes come from when we have completely different takes on things which i th- i'm trying to think what what some of the ones are let's oh um the movie sp- actually it comes to com when it comes to comedies that's where we differ very much in terms of what we think is funny so and i think us arguing over what we actually enjoyed is the most fun. So like the movies, uh, what was it? Not spy. Um, what's the other one? Oh, uh, the spy who dumped me was a fun one. I think and it's also the first, like one of the few that we recorded in person with each other. And so just really getting that energy with each other, I think was fun. Hmm. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. That's, it's definitely a different experience, right? Doing remote versus in person. Oh yeah, definitely. Definitely. I don't think I could handle seeing Cam's face in living color again. <laughs> no, no. no, very the, unpleasant. The, the distance helps, I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> so you've given us your potentially your favorite one you've covered so far. What's the the hidden gem that you've unearthed? Ooh, that is a great question. I'm taking uh, notes basically. So if we haven't covered it, I could be like, ah, <laughs> this is really Ooh. good. Actually, what a um, so we record a little bit in advance and. I think for me, it's watching some of the 60s shows that we have for our co- upcoming, uh, what, are we, what are we going to call it? Our Swinging 60s Spy Summer. 
And so watching some of those like older shows like uh, The Avengers, not not the uh, 1999 movie or 98 movie, but the actual show itself, which is not necessarily a hidden gem, but it's something that I never got around to watching. And so just watching that, I'm like, wow, these characters are well written and they work well together. And yeah, so that was not necessarily a hidden gem, but something that was really fun. But actually, you know what? I'm going to... promo something else one of our episodes that was recently released sergeant stubby an american hero uh if you guys ever want to cover that out go it's kind of entertaining we found out about this at a so uh i'm in the dc area in the spy museum pre-pandemic would occasionally host spy trivia and the, one of the questions was or one of the rounds was about spy animals you had questions of course about you know these the what is it the dolphins that were trained and let's see acoustic kitty which if you've not heard of acoustic kitty uh look that up on your own time it's a crazy story about how the cia basically low jacked a cat hmm. but one of the things that we heard about for the first time was sergeant stubby who was this dog in world war one who caught a german spy in the trenches And they have a whole animated movie about Sergeant Stubby. And so we brought on uh, my wife and another friend to cover that movie. And we released that a few, uh, maybe about a month ago by this time. And so it was, uh, it was a lot of fun too. And we'd never heard of it and never heard of Sergeant Stubby before. I am definitely ignorant in the ways of Sergeant Stubby. So I'll have to check that out. (laughs) Yeah, this is a dog, isn't it? It's a dog. Yeah, I, I saw the artwork on Instagram. I was like, Wow. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's, how how can you be so so brave and yet so provocative at the same time? Like, yeah, it's a, <laughs> such a bold choice. Uh, I I've never heard of it, so we'll have to add it to our uh, extensive list of films to cover. Mm-hmm. Or we might just play your episode that week. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, it is a great episode. I will say. <laughs> it saves us watching it as well. It's a win-win for everyone. <laughs> I mean, and not, not to preface that whole episode so that they don't watch it but we like what i found about that episode was i like that it was it's not a, it's a cartoon dog but it's not a talking dog so everything stays within the realms of our of you know you're not anthro i mean you're anthropomizing it a little bit but it's the, the dog doesn't talk there's no like thought bubbles above the dogs and it tells an actual mostly true story which is very fascinating to me I, like I compared it to there was another movie about you know animals in spy related you know genres during a war, which was a uh, the Disney movie Valiant, which was about the uh, pigeon, the messenger pigeons. So mm-hmm. like, that is complete opposite direction, where talking animals, story that really didn't happen, and all that sort of stuff. But enough about Sergeant Stubby. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want more Sergeant Stubby. I think that <laughs> I, I, I need more Sergeant Stubby in my life. But I think you're right. And I think we should pivot on to what we're talking about this week. Cam, what do we have? That's right. We are going to tackle the 1973 spy thriller, The Macintosh Man, starring Paul Newman and directed by John Huston. Okay. I I checked before we started recording. None of us knew much about this film going into it. Mm-hmm. Is, that, is that suffice to say? Yep. Well, I mean, this is clearly the defining movie of my childhood. I have the uh, <laughs> several posters surrounding me at this very moment. The Macintosh Man. Everyone knows when they think of Cam, the Macintosh Man. I, 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 you know, I've shared a hotel room with you before, Cam, and I know you just get up sometimes, you know, cut your bed open and set it on fire. <laughs> <laughs> and I exclusively eat Macintosh apples. Uh... <laughs> and, and this is also recorded on a Mac. There That's right. Of course. <laughs> of course. And that's enough puns. So let's segue over to the letterbox.com synopsis for The Macintosh Man. Only Macintosh can save them now. And Macintosh is dead. A member of the British intelligence assumes a fictitious criminal identity to allow himself to be caught, imprisoned, and freed in order to infiltrate a spy organization and expose a traitor. Only someone finds him out and exposes him to the gang. Dot, dot, dot. Oh, wow. You really left me hanging there. Macintosh, <laughs> man. That is a synopsis with dramatic value to it. <laughs> yeah, it's got semicolons, commas, dots. It's, it's got everything. That's right. Uh, I think that was an okay one, really. Sort of mm-hmm. set it up. Yeah, I can't complain. Yeah, I think if I had 
heard or read that before I watched the movie, I'd be a lot less confused watching the movie because I felt like, well, yeah, they they didn't explain much going into the movie, and but you know, shall we get? I don't know. Can I start getting into my what I thought about the movie? No, save it for now. Oh yeah, we you're right. To, you're we right. need to know yeah. what we need to know how this film came to be before we can talk about how confused we all are. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Okay, so the story of the Macintosh Man starts really, I guess, with a writer named Walter Hill. Now, are either of you familiar with Walter Hill? I am not. Okay, Scott? Nope. Okay, so Walter Hill is, I think, at this point in, uh, you know, the uh, 2021 is when we record this. Walter Hill's probably best known as the writer-director of 48 Hours, The Warriors, Um, He's also a co-writer and producer on the Alien franchise. Hmm. He uh, co-wrote Alien, Alien 3. He had a story credit on Aliens. Um, He's definitely one of those very reliable writer-directors who never quite had, you know, the massive fame, but genre fans really know him well. He did, like, Last Man Standing with Bruce Willis. He's kind of known for grittier action films. He did um, uh, Red Heat with Schwarzenegger. So... This is early in his career. He's hot off the movie The Getaway, which was the Steve McQueen thriller. And he was dealing with a lawsuit from Warner Brothers. Warner Brothers was suing him for not delivering a screenplay, which was part of his deal. Um, Now, Walter Hill didn't really care. Uh, He was angry at Warner Brothers because they had sold a screenplay he'd written called Hickey and Boggs to United Artists instead of producing it themselves. That film became a 1972 thriller starring Bill Cosby and Robert Culp. It was a I Spy reunion, essentially. Ah. Um, More of a gritty sort of thriller film, but that's what it became. The fact that no one really has heard of Hickey and Boggs since then tells me about, you know, how successful that movie was. But (laughs) (laughs) needless to say, Walter Hill annoyed. So he was dealing with this lawsuit. And basically they decide, okay, he's got to write a screenplay. He has to do it pronto. They sent him a box of books, told him to pick one and adapt it. And the idea would basically be like, I'll just grab a book, adapt it, I'm out, good, contract fulfilled, see you later. And he stumbled across a book called The Freedom Trap by Desmond Bagley. Now, the book was sort of loosely inspired by a uh, Soviet mole in MI6 named George Blake, who was discovered in 1961. Now, he was uh, sentenced to 42 years in jail, but escaped in 66, so after only about five years in prison, and fled to the Soviet Union. Now, as we'll talk about with the Macintosh Man, this isn't a one-to-one comparison, but that was essentially the uh, springing off point for the book, The Freedom Trap. Um, So Walter Hill wrote this screenplay, it sounds like very quickly, and he was genuinely shocked when Paul Newman was lured in by Warner Brothers to do it. Um, Paul Newman at this point is one of the biggest stars in the world, one of the great American icons, and for some reason he was very excited about the Macintosh Man. And so he had just done a movie called The Life and Times of Judge Roy Bean, which was a Western film, quite well reviewed, um, not particularly successful. It kind of did modest sums of money at the box office, but the experience of doing that movie had been very positive and it had been directed by John Huston and produced by a man named John Foreman. And so Paul Newman decided to bring those two people onto the Macintosh Man. Um, I think John Huston had the best quote about his participation in the film. In his book, An Open Book from 1980, he said, we were each offered good round sums to participate. (laughs) Okay. Okay. I'm starting to get a feel for this now. Fine. (laughs) Is that not the greatest quote about the artistic process of joining a film? (laughs) Uh... He might as well just written, (laughs) ka-ching. Now, John Huston is a legendary director. He had written and directed The Maltese Falcon, Treasure of the Sierra Madre, The African Queen. Um, He's done some of the greatest films of all time. He's a very reliable professional, but at this point, he was kind of just bouncing around all over the place and wound up on this film. Uh, When it came to casting the female lead, Candace Bergen was strongly considered. Um, They decided instead, though, to go with Dominique Sanda, who had, I guess, more international appeal because she'd done a couple movies called There Was the Garden of the Finzi Contini's and The Conformist, which were big hits internationally. 
So I'm guessing they wanted this movie to appeal more to international audiences. So that was kind of the thinking there. Um, now this production was plagued with script problems right from day one. So Walter Hill was brought to the location to try to essentially make sense of this film. He could not. <laughs> but he wrote it. Why is he making sense of what he wrote? <sighs> Well, I'm guessing they liked the blueprint, but the blueprint had some issues. And so when they actually came to shooting it, there was issues. And so they brought in a series of uncredited writers. Uh, it looks like four of them going off IMDb. There may have been more. Um, the problems were just figuring out the journey of the character as well as an ending. They didn't figure out an ending for this film until the last week of shooting. <laughs> <laughs> what? Uh, uh, yeah, spoilers, but I, I don't think they figured out an ending to this film. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. <laughs> so when all was said and done, Walter Hill in an interview said he wrote 90% of the first half. That's about it. <laughs> now that makes more sense why they called him back in. Uh-huh. Right. Um, so is this the older, uh, is this the guy who wrote like Born Legacy and then, then fucked off? Uh... <laughs> Oh, Tony Gilroy? No. Yeah. Um, I think Walter Hill tried. It's just that there was... A, a, my guess is that just his process of putting a screenplay together didn't mesh well with what John Huston was looking for as a filmmaker. I mean, John Huston, as I said, this guy goes right back to the 30s. Um, he has a very classical approach to storytelling. I just wonder if that didn't mesh too well with Walter Hill, who's a little bit of that newer generation. Fair enough. Yeah. The movie, uh, considering all of its issues was not a success at the box office at all in any way, shape or form. <laughs> um, <laughs> it made about, it seems like 1.5 million domestically. Um, not great. I could not find a budget, but I'm guessing it's more than 1.5 million. <laughs> do, do you know where it sat for the year at least? No. Um, the problem is it's very tough to pin down box office for this one. It would have fallen way down the list. Uh, I can tell you, the number one movie was The Exorcist, and this is in Worldwide. The domestic box office for um, Macintosh Man is all it's available. My guess is because it performed so poorly, they didn't make any sort of effort to show it overseas. So at a worldwide chart, it really falls way, way down the list. Um, so number one is The Exorcist. Number two was The Sting, another Paul Newman movie. So don't worry about Paul Newman, people. He was doing <laughs> just fine. And uh, number three was American Graffiti, George Lucas's big breakthrough. Um, some other spy films from this year, Live and Let Die was number seven. Enter the Dragon with Bruce Lee was number 11. And the Day of the Jackal film was number 18. So Macintosh Man, not one of the big gems at the box office, at least in terms of earnings for spy films in 1973. <laughs> Does that surprise you? Not I, one bit. Do you know, in, in not looking at the film... But just looking at sort of on paper who's doing it, you would think it would be somewhat of a guaranteed success. <laughs> yeah. You John think? Houston, Paul Newman, they're big names. James Mason's there as well. And he's you know, yep. he's a household name. Um I, we can't I mean Dominique Sander, as you mentioned, was more of an international name, but the ones I just mentioned before, you could put them on top of a poster and people would turn up. You or you you would think yeah and you could say from the writer of the getaway that would have meant something as well at that point in time mm. yeah it does I mean to answer your question it does surprise me actually uh, not not to foreshadow what I felt about the film but on on paper I think it should have done better yeah so ultimately don't feel bad for any of these guys um, John Huston the next year would go on to co-star in Chinatown and direct and co-write 1975's The Man Who Would Be King, which would get him an Oscar nomination for Best Screenplay. He did okay. Paul Newman had the sting this year. The next year he stars in the biggest blockbuster, uh, probably of the year, The Towering Inferno. Paul Newman's good. Don't worry about him, folks. And Walter Hill takes a bit of a minor break before coming back. He writes the 1975 Paul Newman movie, The Drowning Pool, and has his directorial debut, Hard Times, with Charles Bronson, and that kickstarts his directorial career. He's fine too. So it's more like I think the Macintosh Man is just sort of a curiosity among this really interesting trio. Hmm. And how did this one come uh, come across your lap, Cam? Because I think this is your choice. <laughs> um. So yeah, a little behind the scenes, we have a big master list of spy films to cover for the podcast, and. I will just sometimes Google around and look for 
spy films to add that maybe are hidden gems or just things that uh, you know people don't have on the tip of their tongue. And when I saw a John Huston film starring Paul Newman listed as a spy film, I said, oh, this is a must do at some point because these are two big talents. Hmm. Well, here we are. Mm. Okay. Uh, do you have anything else for us, Cam? Nope. That about wraps up the Macintosh, man. Okay. So let's get into uh, what we thought about the film. We, we've, we've kind of all hinted little bits and bobs, but I really want to know, Christian, you're our guest. Take us away. What did you think of the Macintosh man? So I was fascinated by just what was going on. Fascinated in that, not in a great, good way, but just this felt like three or four different movies all mashed into one, which makes complete sense with all the different writers they had on this. Like, all right, at the very beginning, I was getting a very, like, spy who came in for the cold vibe from, okay, you know, we're going to send you in. We're going to, you know, you won't, you'll, but of course we don't know what he's supposed to be doing because they give us zero information of, oh, what you're trying to do. <laughs> at least we kind of had a hint of that, you know, when you watch the spy who came in from the cold. And then, like, the middle half felt to me like, weirdly enough, what the part of uh, on her Majesty's secret service when she, when he's at the top and he has to you know he's infiltrated and he's trying to escape you know that building and he's like wearing the exact same thing Lazenby's wearing when he escapes Piz Gloria. <laughs> I was like that's what I know. I was like all right the the mustard uh, uh, cardigan with the striped you know button up shirt. This is is he is he cosplaying Lazenby? What's going on here? It was the style at the time. <laughs> And then, um, like, the last half weirdly reminded me of Sky... Or not, last third, not half. Reminded me of Skyfall. All right, you're going off into the countryside and all that sort of stuff. But it's like, but only just in landscape, not in actual story beats. I, like, I, I didn't know what they were trying to say. And apparently the, the film didn't either. <laughs> oh, I, yeah, actually, what gave me more strong Skyfall vibes was the ending in, like, a church. Oh, I thought you were going to say the burning mansion. Oh, that too. Yeah, like, like yeah, there's like elements of things that just like reminded me of Skyfall, but it's just like not not done well. I mean, Skyfall, that whole scene and the whole like uh, the Scottish Highland stuff in in Skyfall is robbing from past Bond films and also mm, yes. you know, the Thirty Nine Steps and stuff like that. Um, mm. You know, borrowing from better films, I would say. <laughs> um, what? Okay, so what about you, Cam? What did you think? I kind of like this movie even though i agree with everything christian said and that it is very messy um and believe me off the uh initial chapters of this movie i was a little baffled as to what the heck was going on because as you said there's no setup no exposition it's just like okay people are talking about things i don't understand but um what i kind of dug about this was it has a very specific tone it's very downbeat it has that sort of gritty 70s style. It's not in a hurry. It's very lackadaisical in its pacing. And I kind of settled into the mood of it. Like, I think John Huston captures a very interesting mood with this movie. Narrative is not its strong point. I agree 100%. And I can't wait to dive into the confusing elements of this movie. But when it was all said and done, I kind of was like, I, I enjoyed the journey, even though it wasn't necessarily satisfying. It was more just... I love the filmmaking style of John Huston. I think, and I, again, also look forward to diving into the casting of this film, but um, I thought that Paul Newman's star charisma was pretty strong as well. Like it carried me through the movie. So even if I was baffled or getting a little frustrated by the journey, there was always a certain amount of entertainment for me just kind of being sucked in by the vibe and the John Huston direction. Okay. So sort of not contrasting opinions there, but different takes certainly. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, like I, I'm very mixed. It's just that it's the type of mix that I was able to enjoy versus a movie that just put me off. It, it's it's quite odd. I actually sort of come down in between the two of you a little bit because my first note is this plot is all over the place. <laughs> like it, it doesn't know, it doesn't seem to want to know. And it's it's a question I kind of want to tackle later on. Maybe it's a bigger topic because we, you know, we all three of us do spy movie podcasts. Um, you know, should spy movie plots be complicated to the point where they're hard to follow? Mm-hmm. This this film, it, it, it's not like say something was like say Funeral in Berlin, for instance, where it's complicated, but the breadcrumbs are there mm-hmm. if you pay attention. Whereas this film doesn't give you anything. You are left to you know 
understand it at, at a pace it gives you information, which is as you know, Paul Newman's character is learning it basically. Uh, and that's frustrating at times, but there's this like, I just wrote down a cool factor to this film. It just has this sort of effortlessly cool pull to it that I really found hard to put a finger on exactly what it was because the pacing's all over the place. Maybe it's like a tone thing, like Cam said, but like there's just certain moments where I was like, yeah, this is this is pretty cool. And even though I'm frustrated by actor choice or you know pacing, I, I still kind of dug it. Like it's impossible to get emotionally engaged in the movie, I found. Mm -hmm. But in terms of a more kind of appreciating what the director is kind of putting on the screen in terms of visuals and atmosphere, I was kind of sucked in by that. But I, I agree. Like if you're hoping to enter this movie and become emotionally engaged in the journey of Paul Newman, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't help that he doesn't seem to care. <laughs> Paul, Paul Newman has one level. <laughs> yeah, it's funny because Paul Newman is like one of the biggest stars in the world at this point. He's so famous for movies like, well, The Sting this same year, or Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, um, Cool Hand Luke, which this movie has a nod to where they're eating eggs in prison. Um, that's what Paul Newman's famous for. He also has a few espionage or spy films, none of which are considered his best films. So we will be <laughs> delving into Paul Newman in the future, but it seems like he didn't have the best eye for spy scripts. <laughs> Interesting. I, well, bringing it back to Cars 2. Oh, wait, no, he wasn't in Cars 2, was he? But he was in Cars 1. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let's, I mean, we've all mentioned the plot. Mm -hmm. the, you know, the, the, the story of the film. Um, so let's tackle that first. It's mm -hmm. kind of all over the place. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> and you can, I, I mean, you kind of set us up, Cam, when you told us what happened behind the scenes. It, it, and it does sort of explain it. Yeah. But it is also somewhat unforgivable that this is a film that was put out. It, from a story <laughs> sense. <laughs> oh. Okay, so the movie wants to keep the audience in the dark right off the bat. Because mm -hmm. you have Paul Newman... Um, you know, beating up a mailman to steal diamonds. And I just need to know, quick, before I move on, Scott, is this a thing in Britain? Do you guys mail diamonds a lot? <laughs> uh, only on Wednesdays. Okay, mm. fair enough, fair enough. Because I was like, oh, wow, interesting. <laughs> but um... it's, 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 it's rubies most days, but diamonds are Wednesdays only. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so we find out that Paul Newman is going to steal diamonds, and then he's sent to prison. And... We've had this meeting scene between him and the titular Macintosh man, played by Harry Andrews, and also um, Dominique Sanders' character, Mrs. Smith, at the start. And it's like everything these characters are talking about, I had no idea what they were explaining. <laughs> um, but I'm also like, okay, that's fine. It's a spy film. I'm okay mm -hmm. with being left in the dark. But I think for me where the problem lies is I don't mind that we're in the dark as to what Paul Newman's mission is. But you've also got like this villain played by James Mason, who I could not figure out who this character even was through the majority of the movie. And so it's kind of like you don't have anything to hang on to because the Paul Newman character going into the prison is such an enigma. It's like, what am I compelled by? I don't understand the mission and I don't understand the character. I had also forgotten that that was Wheeler, like from that we met early on. And I was like, oh, wait, that was the guy he, that uh, Macintosh was talking to before. I was like, I like completely missed that and, and had to go back and oh wait yeah that was him. I mean also it's in my in spy fi guys we sometimes describe it as you know a sea of white British people and it's hard to keep track of who's who. Mm. We've had a number of movies like that. Oh yeah, oh yeah. There's several of those for sure. I mean I revel in this scenario, but I am a, a white <laughs> British guy. <laughs> it's hard not to enjoy it, I suppose. Uh, it, it was it was quite interesting to see, and and James Mason we'll, we'll probably get to later, but for me he was probably the the shining star of the film. Oh, that's interesting because to me, <laughs> I found that character such a blank. I'm like, am I supposed to be compelled by anything going on with this character who I have no idea who they are? I found that to be a big part of the problem for me. I think if you'd had a villain or a, at least a conspiracy, I understood and everything else was in shadows, then I would be able to at least have something dragging me along. I think that was the big problem for me. I think a lot of British people, and, and maybe this is this is just a local thing, can understand an MP that's a bit of a wrong one. Okay, it's a, okay. fair enough. Okay. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. So you know, you, you you instantly hate him because you know you're you're probably represented by someone who's just the same. 
<laughs> uh, you know, my I, my representative is Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister, and oh, uh, sure. All right. yeah, I I'm not going to expound my opinions about him on this podcast, but uh, you know, I could definitely understand why people wouldn't like him. Fair enough. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Although just watching this movie now, I found his character so tough to read off his first scene that I had no strong opinions on James Mason at all. <laughs> I could I could kind of understand it, but like having this 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 plot you can't really understand a main character you can't really get behind and then a villain that you also don't know really what his intentions are it does prove to be somewhat of a of a blank film that you can't get invested in i think you need to have at least one element of it clear so that the audience can say okay i don't understand what paul newman's doing but I can understand what like the mission is or something like that. Like I understand who this character specifically is. I mean, this movie also juggles this whole identity of the Paul Newman character. He's like an Australian dude. And then he's like, apparently a British agent. I mean, right. Uh, pa- I was yeah. confused by that. Cause when I was, once I watched it, I was like, wait, Paul Newman's American, right? It's <laughs> like, I had to think about it. It's like, no, he's. I'm pretty sure he's American. It's like, why is he playing a British agent? I was like, you know, what? I'm gonna, I'll just go with it. And then he started speaking in the Australian accent. Like, wait, he's not Australian, is he? What? <laughs> it like, I, I actually had to remember that he was American and figure out, figure out. Oh wait, where is this going with this? <laughs> well, he presents this um, Australian accent up front and refers to <laughs> waltzing Matilda. And my take was when he did the accent oh, it's supposed to be terrible, and he's making fun of how bad his accent is. <laughs> and then I was like, oh, wait. Oh I think these characters are actually thinking this is an okay accent. I was getting flashbacks to um, Kevin Costner in Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. <laughs> but like that wasn't even an Australian accent. And I, I don't know what Paul Newman's accent is supposed to be in real life. I don't know where he's actually from. He could be Canadian-American. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but it jumps back between sort of Cockney English to Australian (laughs) to, I think, American at times that I think he loses track of who he is. Uh, Yeah, and sure, if you have a character that maybe that's his whole thing is he's bounced all over the world, so he's kind of lost his identity. I think that could be really interesting. That is not in the movie, though. (laughs) No, it is not. And you know what? I had to look it up. So Paul Newman is, yeah, he's American. He's from Ohio. Actually, I think from the same uh, town that my mother-in-law is from. Oh, wow. Uh, Small world. Very nice. Yeah. Well, I mean, just to go back to what Cam said before, just if we're just dealing with the plot side of things, if we're meant to have a character that we can connect to, the only one I think that we're meant to try and connect to is Dominique Sanders' character of Mrs. Smith. Who is only in, like, what, a third, if that, of the movie? Well, you, you get this whole, like, I mean, it's her, Macintosh is, is it her dad? Is that right? Yes, which we don't find out until very late in the day. And he gets run over by the, the bad guy's henchman, I assume. Yeah, and the fact that they didn't figure out the ending till the last minute makes me wonder if a lot of that father revenge stuff all was figured out at the end, so it's not really in the, you know, front sections of the movie. So, so we basically have no one to connect ourselves to. <laughs> well, that's the thing. It's playing it very aloof. Like, this is an incredibly aloof spy movie. And, hey, there are a lot of great aloof spy films, but it's one that really does hold you at a distance. I can understand why it's not a crowd pleaser. And that, you know, for example, in the same sort of era, you get, like, The Conversation. I think the next year from Coppola. Uh, mm-hmm. And that's a movie that can be a little chilly as well, but you're so sucked in by the character, it carries you through. This one just doesn't have that that strength of character I think you need. So it is entirely an atmosphere and tone piece versus a character-driven or story-driven film. And does it manage to pull it off? <sighs> well, it depends where you sit. Because like for me, the journey this character goes on, just like the prison setting um, and like the safe house he goes to after escaping, I actually was really interested in sort of the intrigue built up in these scenarios yeah that's fair i mean i guess for me it was you know i guess i've seen so many spy movies and i was waiting for for me oh you know you'll have the mission well maybe maybe this is more of a mission impossible thing you know you'll have the mission oh and obviously something's going to go wrong and there's like another layer to and something so i was expecting something like that when he goes into prison and i guess you do get some of that but we know so little of what is supposed to happen 
mm. that we don't really know when things go wrong if they have gone wrong. I think it was my issue. Yeah, and they build up this character um, named Slade, played by Ian Bannon, as who, who's like a communist spy who's in the prison. And he's only like referred to once and then is so thoroughly tied to the plot, you're like, boy, they maybe should have established this as something that actually matters. It, it feels like a lot of plot elements just kind of being thrown together that aren't being fleshed out. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the prison sequence, and again, I have another question for Scott. As someone who is British, in prisons there, do people have to wear shirts and ties? With like very short ties. Yeah. Well, I, I have to throw a question back to you, Cam. How many prisons do you think I've been to? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Scott, we all know you've been busted for espionage a few times. Or thievery. <laughs> I was in Broadmoor just the other day. <laughs> You two are making eggs in the uh, in the laundry <laughs> facilities. Uh, you can't actually say that now. Making eggs is a is a euphemism in prisons now. Oh Jesus! <laughs> uh, much like that guy was hinting at when they were getting breakfast on his first day in prison, which was such a bizarre little moment. Yeah, well, I didn't know what was going on with that. There was there's a few different like just sort of moments where like, all right, what's the sexual politics here at play? It's between that and the um what was it the woman after they've escaped and she's like oh i haven't been a woman for months now i was like what does that mean <laughs> yeah i really didn't get that line either um but to answer cam's actual question they used to wear ties and, and jackets they don't do that anymore oh. oh okay i was like wow that is so british <laughs> when i saw them <laughs> wearing ties in prison i was like oh my god that's amazing <laughs> you have to dress sharp wherever you are mm. i guess so yeah mm. Manners make of the man. <laughs> um, yeah, the the prison stuff I found to be quite bizarre because, you know, by the time he escapes, and that's maybe after 20 minutes of time, uh, screen time in the film, they, they mentioned he's been in there for 15 months. Yeah, I mean, they definitely blaze through um, the prison time. To be fair, this movie is 98 minutes, and I'm sure there may have been some cutting to uh, make this a more fast-paced film because it's a little <laughs> messy. But I also found that 98 minutes fairly easy to sit through. Like if this had been like two hours, 15 minutes, I think I may have been more, you know, felt a little more punished by it. But you are right. Like the prison sequence, to me, it was more the atmosphere, just sort of this character going through this experience. But it is very short-lived. And you're right. The 15 months does not feel like 15 months. It feels like maybe 15 days. Yeah, it really throws you off because you just think, you know, he doesn't seem to look weathered at all. Mm -hmm. It's like well, it's like it is Paul Newman. Well, that is true. <laughs> you know, you do get a good complexion from eating hard boiled eggs out of a washing machine. I've heard. <laughs> um, I, I wonder if he ever took that guy up on his offer. Mm, well, we'll never know. Um, what did you guys think of his big escape? It wasn't great. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, really? Like a crane dropping a net over the wall? That seems very easy to prevent. <laughs> I mean, one thing I will say about that, and some of the other things in the film as well, this film wants to be realistic at times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you think about the ending, for instance, which we, we sort of brushed on, where uh, the, the character of Reardon lets the bad guys go. Yeah, because he has nothing to gain from it. And and the logical assumption would be there's no point having a shootout. Let's all leave here with our lives intact. And then obviously, of course, something happens. But that feels like such a real thing that mm -hmm. they would go there and be like, there's no point. Let's just move on. Well, they reference chess several times throughout the game as or throughout the movie as well. And that's one thing um, that they really come back to is the spy game. And they realized, like, at that point, they basically got a stalemate. So why bother? Let's just call it. And we'll start a new game over again in the future. Like, it, that, this one's over. I kind of appreciated that about the message of the movie, that it is this sort of dehumanizing, you know, game that these participants play in. No one is really that invested in what is going on. The general world does not care what these three guys are up to. So... Why bother? Let's just survive another day. I, I appreciated that as the message. I don't know if the movie leads there for moment one, but I could kind of appreciate that it was going there. Yeah, I was very, I was actually very surprised by that, that that part of the ending where you know he said what you said, and 
because I was all ready for, oh, right, you know, here it is, you know, the big confrontation, the shoot, some sort of, maybe not like, obviously not like a big Bond action scene shootout, but something maybe more personal, but, you know, with just like a few guns or something. And then when it just ended like with that, you know, oh, you know, yeah, let's all just walk away. I was like, I was, I actually had to rewind. like, wait, did I catch that right? So did that, did that disappoint you? Because I, I actually quite liked that. It felt real. No, it didn't disappoint me. It was just surprising to me. Right. Okay. Yeah. I, the, this film doesn't really like lean on the fantastic that say Bond mm-hmm. would or Mission Impossible or anything like that. It definitely is a lot more grounded. Uh, yeah, unlike say like Condor Man. <laughs> uh, but so I, I think that's what lends to that cool factor I mentioned earlier that I think Cam was picking mm-hmm. up on as well. Yeah. What do you think? What do you think, Cam? I, I think so. Like, honestly, when everyone was just going to walk away, I kind of appreciated that. It was that sort of 70s, like, there's a certain vibe to 70s film where it's a certain amount of distrust in the government, distrust in authority, and sort of the idea that these guys in this moment say, you know what, we don't really care what anyone tells us, we're all just going to walk away. It feels like very 70s. And look, there are far better 70s movies that tackle this sort of concept, but it has that cool, that sort of like, you know, we'll deal with this another day. Whatever, let's just move on, guys. I, I kind of appreciated that. We, we mentioned it on a, a earlier episode, probably one of our earliest episodes, uh, Born Identity, maybe, or something like that. But you and I, Cam, are both uh, work to live instead of live to work kind of people. Mm. Mm. <laughs> and uh, Paul Newman's uh, Reardon character, the spy, it, it, I, I feel like he's definitely one of those, one, one of us. Yeah, he, he definitely doesn't. Well, I don't know. I mean, would you agree to go to prison? For like 15 months? I don't know that I would. I don't think he agreed to go to prison. <laughs> no, that's true. <laughs> Who that, knows? That, that's what confuses me. That's a good question. Did he know he was going to have to go to prison for this? Or did he just know, all right, I'm supposed to steal this and then we'll go with whatever the mission is from there? I don't know that we really know that. The movie never really tells us what his plan w- was from moment one. Because we know that he's going to go beat up this guy to get diamonds. Um, and at this point, I'm thinking he's trying to infiltrate a diamond smuggling ring. Mm-hmm. And the next thing I know, he's thrown in prison for 20 years. And I'm like, okay. And I, I had read a bit of a synopsis. So I knew that the prison thing was a you know part of his spy mission. But I'm still wondering, well, hold on. Like, does this character, was this his plan all along? Because he has moments where he acknowledges that himself and Slade, the, you know, commie spy, um, were bait in this whole thing. So it's like, also they have, I don't know, did they have power over their situation or not? I could, the movie is very vague on these sorts of details. It's, it's interesting because you just think, why does he go back to the, the mission, as it were, after his escape? He gets away from the sort of halfway house when he's he's rescued from prison. And, mm. and he does the most unforgivable thing anyone could ever do, which is kill a dog in a movie. Great moment. Great moment. I was actually like, I really love the moodiness of that whole escape. There's a scene where he's like running across like these, this grass and rocks and everything away from the safe house. And um, the music is super moody. And it looked beautiful. I love that whole sequence. And yeah, when he's like drowning a dog, I'm like, this is pretty hardcore stuff. Yeah, mm-hmm. what a prick. <laughs> yeah. Um, But then like, He's, so he's then, he calls Mrs. Smith to kind of save him, I guess, to get him away from uh, Ireland. It turns out he finds out he's in Ireland, in Galway, mm. I believe. Um, but then he chooses to go back and chase down George Wheeler and Slade. I, I think at the behest of Mrs. Smith, but he, he's got half of his money left. Why doesn't he just bugger off? Well, part of the problem is, though, that all of the intel relating to his mission is being held by Macintosh, who is in a coma because he's been hit by a car. Um, and so he can't be basically freed from, because he's on the run. He's wanted for being, you know, escaping from prison. So he needs Macintosh to clear him. So I think at this point, he's feeling like he has to expose Wheeler um, as the villain so that he can be, you know, get a clear bill, basically. And of course, so we can have a movie. <laughs> well, that too. That too. Um, okay, well, I, I want to touch on some of the individual performances, but one thing I did note down, I don't know how you guys felt about this, and, and Cam, you actually mentioned the complete opposite, so we're actually contrasting on this one. 
I felt the score in this film was awful. And <laughs> oh, really? It was barely there. It wasn't there when it needed to be, and it was very repetitive. Oh, I actually really liked it. I, I thought it had a lot of personality, and I loved when it would have these moodier patches like that escape from the, the halfway house or the safe house where it felt almost like something from almost like a supernatural horror film. I really dug that. Well, Christian, you have to tie break this one, I think. Ooh, I would, honestly, it was very forgettable for me that like I think can kind of remember... You know, there, there, that one. You know, I guess it would be whatever the theme we would call the theme mm. of it was that you know plays after you know, I think close to the end of the movie. But other than that, I, I like I don't remember a lot of the other scoring, and I only watch this today, so it's not like I saw this last week. So it it was really forgettable for me. No. That's totally fair. Uh, I don't know. For me, it really did capture, again, when I was talking about how much I enjoyed the atmosphere of the movie, the score when it was used was actually a big part of that. But this is coming from the person who enjoyed a scene where a dog got drowned. (laughs) Well, you know, I complained when we did those Harry Palmer TV movies that the dog survived. So uh, I was in favor of at least one dog um, getting (laughs) the short end of the stick. Um, And let's be honest, this was not the nicest dog. Hmm, That's true. And not owned by the nicest man either. No, it was very like it was like Cujo's cousin. <laughs> <laughs> I will say that middle section where he's after he's escaped and bef- um, bef- um, a- escaped from prison and and in the hold of. Do we really? I guess we don't really find out who these. Well, is that Slade? Isn't not. I guess we don't find out who is holding him. Do we really? Or is that are they associated with? Um, what's James Mason's character Wheeler? I don't think they are. I think it's just a separate organization that busted him out. That whole section of it kind of reminded me of the prisoner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So I was like, I was, I was digging on that. He's like, all right, just sort of just the weirdness of it, of and you're like, oh, I don't know where I am. I'm being held here, and all this sort of stuff. So I, I, like, I liked parts of these this movie. But I've noticed that the parts that I've liked are always the parts that remind me of other things. <laughs> totally fair. I really like that safe house section as well, actually. It might be the strongest section of the movie for me. Um, I like that it felt like kind of a strange environment. I like that Paul Newman's character, I think he has a certain amount of snark through the prison. Like, I think Paul mm-hmm. Newman's fairly comfortable. Whereas I think the halfway house throws him off his guard a little bit. Mm, and yeah. when you have that very tall woman, like, kicking the crap out of him, I'm like, this is pretty awesome. <laughs> Again, Cam wants to see people get hurt. I do. <laughs> what kind of mood are you in today, buddy? Are you all right? <laughs> do you need a hug? <laughs> no, apparently, apparently. But I, it, it had, like, sort of a toughness to it that, you know, we've talked a lot about a lot of more, you know, popcorn spy films. And I like mm. that this one would make you think like Paul Newman's just going to coast through on charm the way he does in, you know, Cool Hand Luke or something like that. But every time he tried to pull that act, these like people would beat him down. (laughs) That actually, that scene in the the halfway house, I suppose, you you do get to see him be a spy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He sets up that trap to confuse the guy who owns the house and owns the dog as well. uh, Mr. Brown, I believe. Uh, and, and that's probably about the most spy you see him. I mean, I did like when he does that little thing with the door to like have to close behind him. Yeah, I thought that was really cool. And he sets up so the toilet flushes as well. Yeah. Um, and then getting the guy to call downstairs to get the, the, the woman who's not a woman, which, uh, as Christian says, I don't understand that line. Um, yeah, I don't know. And, and, and this is some sort of, no, no, I've got nothing. No. but then i think this what leans into what we said earlier that the 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 sort of tone and the pacing is all over the place in this film because you've got this opening section where you get the briefing and he steals the diamonds he's on the run he's getting questioned quizzed by the police and then he's got this whole prison scene sequence for like 20 minutes that does feel like the prisoner and then he's got the whole 39 steps rip off Mm -hmm. and then they're on some sort of bond mission in malta (laughs) <laughs> and you've also got Jason Bourne of him swimming through the water. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I think that's probably what's held me back from enjoying this film as much, was that I was constantly not sure where I was. Well, I don't think Paul Newman was either. 
<laughs> so it's really bringing you into that experience that he's having. Does that mean that I am the Macintosh man? Um, I think it might be. We yes. all are the Macintosh man. <laughs> We're going to name this episode The Macintosh Men. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Okay, well, let's let's touch on some of the individual performances before we start uh, looking at knock lists and stuff like that. Um, So we, we of course, have Paul Newman. Uh, I wasn't particularly familiar with his work. I've seen Cool Hand Luke, um, a couple of his films, but not enough to really know what his range is. Mm. Um, So this was really my first sitting down, paying attention to his performances. It was fine, but I don't think he he did much for me. Hmm. What do you guys think, Cam? Um, I mean, it's definitely him kind of in some ways going on autopilot of the Paul Newman charm. You kind of have that, you know, he's a, a little bit rough around the edges, but he's so cool. He just kind of lays back and makes snarky comments from time to time. We've seen that in, you know, better used in some superior Paul Newman movies. It definitely felt like kind of a programmer. He's just kind of plugging his charm into this movie. And I think it's pretty invaluable. Like if you cast someone who is just like a lead weight in this movie, it would be brutal. But when I'm watching him take place in a car chase or what have you, um, you know, I'm buying it. I'm buying the intensity of his performance. I just, maybe it's part of a larger discussion we'll have over the course of talking about some of these other casting decisions. I think this movie's casting is really weird. And that like, we talked about Paul Newman's playing a British agent. Paul Newman is like the least British man ever. Like he is such an American actor mm-hmm. that it just is very strange. And look, I think his charisma is invaluable for keeping this movie going. But at the same time, British agent? <laughs> like what? <laughs> what is Was he British though? I still don't know if I really understand if he was British or Australian. He was British. When was that confirmed? At the end of the movie. Where they, yeah, they say he's a British agent. Well, I mean, unless he's just an American, like, you know, he's yeah, he just you know, an American who works for the Brits. Yeah. Maybe. Or, or, or he's Australian. <laughs> That's the thing. Like, this movie expects me to believe that people think this man has a good Australian accent. <laughs> so if you tell me at the end he's a British agent, I'm going to go with you because I'm like, well, I guess. I mean, he seemed to be a passable... Um, you know, Australian agent. I mean, at one point they say they're going to make him like a Canadian. And I'm like, okay, I guess like maybe that's the whole point of this character is he can be anything you want him to be. But Paul Newman doesn't have that sort of chameleon persona to him. Like Paul Newman was not a chameleon. He's a icon. He's a movie star. Maybe if you're going to do that type of character, you need more of a chameleon actor. Do you know what I want to be? Hmm. Invested. <laughs> I, I I think he's somewhat invested. I think he's keeping this movie going. I think he's doing a lot of heavy lifting. Yeah, I yeah. would definitely say so. Uh, I'm I'm on the James Mason train, boys. <laughs> no, I. Yeah, he was the thing that was really holding. Uh, Paul Newman was the thing hold, really holding my interest in it. Although my, I'm trying to think of what other movies I've seen him in, other than obviously the first Cars movie, um, <laughs> and. What is it? What was the oh, uh, the color of money, mm-hmm, which yeah. in both where he's playing a mentor role. So this is, I guess, my first experience with him, like in his maybe a little past his prime, but um, so it was interesting to see it for, for me from that perspective. And I mean that even though yeah, he may have been phoning it in a little, his sort of innate coolness basically just led me through it. <laughs> I don't think he can turn that off. And I think that's kind of the the beauty of the movie. Like it was smart to cast him in this movie because so often you'll see in a theater a very mediocre movie, but you have a totally watchable star that will make the experience pleasant even if you don't think the story is very good. And I think that's a little bit of the case here. The the jumping Jack Flash effect. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, Okay. So, well, Cam, you said you weren't a big fan of the casting of this film, but it sounds like you were happy with Paul Newman. Well, okay, I'm happy that you have his movie star charisma, but I think he's terrible casting for the role, mm. if that makes sense. So uh, well, uh, maybe we'll do this at the end, like a recast in your head. So let's move oh, on. Oh, God. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll leave it with you now and <laughs> let you think about it. But let's get to Dominic Sander, who you said was, was cast just to have the sort of its national appeal. Yeah. I, I mean, not to... I, I didn't get any appeal. She's legit terrible, right? Like I, I wrote down she reminds me of Tommy Wiseau. 
<laughs> oh, wow. I mean, at least she had a real French accent. Did she? True, true. I would think so. Sounded better than tell me why so. I, I don't know what accents are what anymore, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you know what? I'll give you that because in my mind, I couldn't figure it out. And until it was she was speaking with someone else who had a French accent, that's what, like on the boat. That's when I connected. Oh, that's a French accent. But I like, didn't really register to me until that point. You just think about um, a film we covered n- not so long ago, uh, Notorious, the Alfred Hitchcock film. Mm. And at the end of the film, is it Ingrid Bergman? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and she was you know, looking at Carson Hurst for this film, funnily enough. And at the end of the film, she's sort of captured and she's being poisoned by Claude Rains's character. And she's she's selling the fact that she feels trapped and she's there's like the walls are coming in at her and she knows that she's she's messed up and she's she's in trouble. And there's a scene where she, uh, Dominique Sanders character is poisoned by James Mason's character, George Wheeler. But I all I saw was just this blank face. And that's the problem. Like maybe this actress is phenomenal in more of her international films. Mm-hmm. Like maybe there is struggles with the language barrier here um, because boy, this character has to do a couple things. Number one, um, her character has a major shift there in the ending where she's the one that guns down Mason and um, Slade. And so it is a revenge tale for her and the character doesn't sell that intensity at all. And then also, she also has to have sort of an erotic spark with Paul Newman, and there is none whatsoever. Mm, no, he had more of a spark with the woman at the halfway house. Yeah, yeah, the tall woman that was, like, beating him up. Who, Gerda? Was that her name? Yeah. Yeah. He had more of a spark with the dude in prison. <laughs> Like, there's a scene where the two characters are laying by the pool, just, like, eyeing each other. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. this is doing nothing whatsoever. Like, these two actors might as well be staring at blank walls. One of them was. (laughs) (laughs) I'm being very mean. I'm I'm, I'm sorry to Dominique Sander. I'm I'm sure you're wonderful in in other things. Scott, do you need a hug as well? Maybe I do. Or or just to figure out accents. Maybe I'm not able to do accents anymore. I don't know. <laughs> and I know that like Candace Bergen was up for this role. And um the thing about Candace Bergen is it's not a great role, like it's very underwritten, but Candace Bergen has an innate intelligence she cannot hide. It's in like anything mm. she does, you just buy that this character is a very capable, smart person. And I think if you have her in this role, she is like Newman gonna carry so much of her natural skills into a maybe underwritten character that you're gonna go along with it more. I can definitely see that, yeah, with his innate coolness and her innate intelligence, and actually just those two. Have they? I'm trying to think if they would ever been in anything together. I don't uh, think so. I don't think not off the top of my head, but I wouldn't rule it out. Mm. Maybe in the maybe in the 60s or 70s, that's just not popping to my mind. I, I will point out, I I just made a mistake. Uh, I uh, I combined Ing- Ingrid Bergman and and Candice Bergman, I believe it is. Uh, which is, is Bergen? Bergen. Yeah, I did it again. Ah. Uh, I, I, I combined the two in my head uh, just before. I, I knew what I was talking about with uh, Notorious, so don't write us about this one. <laughs> Both great actors. Uh, yes, definitely. True. Um, okay, well, you guys didn't seem to like him, so tell me about James Mason. I mean, for me, he was just sort of just, yeah, like a blank slate. Like, I didn't get much out of him, really, until maybe the end when we, you know, that reveal that, oh, yes, he... He, I mean, I guess we're told that he's the villain, but we don't even really see that until that very end, like probably right around the time with the, yeah, when the yacht, when he, Paul Newman jumps off of the boat. That's really when we actually sort of see, all right, his, you know, I guess if there is a villain to this, he, he, it'd be him, but the, his villainy or anything like that. Or before, it's just sort of, all right, you know, M, you know, politician that's, I don't know, maybe involved, maybe not, we're not sure, so... It was just too blank for me to feel, like really attach anything until that until the, the twist or the turn, yeah. Yeah, for me, I felt the same way in that I, I had no idea who this character was. I, I think I made a note around the point where he was having the, you know, gala where he'd invited all the local, you know, important people. And I'm like, is he just playing James Mason? Because I have no <laughs> idea who this character is. It's just like, all they're expecting us to do is just be like, well, it's James Mason. That's who this character is. It's not until you get to 
you know, it's that final scene in particular where they're talking about the spy game that you're going to get a little more of that James Mason gravitas. But when I compare this to like the great James Mason roles, it's uh, pretty thin. I, I, okay. I can't really defend that. You both made very <laughs> valid points to, to be fair. <laughs> I think one thing that would have really improved actually this character is to have, I don't know, one scene where he talks to Slade, the um, spy that he's housing. Like, have those two characters have a conversation. That might have helped a little. Did they never interact with each other? Not until the end. That's right. I'd, I had to think about that. Yeah. You reminded me of an interesting uh, bit in the film. I, I, I got a laugh out of me, but I don't think it was an intentional laugh. Okay. And that is uh, Paul Newman jumping off the boat. <laughs> you never see that coming do you <laughs> i've seen this film twice now and both times i was like oh wait <laughs> it's just flying off the boat it's an amazing dive too it's not like a quick like just jump off the boat it's like a full beautiful like 10 out of 10 dive it's great if i had a 10 sign i'd be holding it right now <laughs> there's a little foreshadowing to it what um what is it once they've got once uh smith or Mrs. Smith and Reardon have gotten away, and he like dives into the pool uh, to go up to ne- next to her, but not really much. You like so okay, he knows how to dive. Maybe like that's maybe one breadcrumb they actually give, but other than that, he's like you should never see that coming. <laughs> I actually never connected those two things, so that's actually a very valid point. The pool dive, I didn't, I didn't connect that. Yeah, I didn't either, actually. So uh, maybe that's a character um, element they should have introduced earlier, that this character is a really good swimmer. When's he going to show that off? In prison? (laughs) (laughs) Hmm. (laughs) Well, I mean, uh, you know, Walter Hill wrote a movie uh, for Paul Newman a couple years later called The Drowning Pool. Maybe he's doing a lot of swimming in that. Right, yeah. Well, I I, I now know if I ever want to get out of a conversation, my my phrase is going to be, I want to get off the boat. (laughs) (laughs) I, I was curious, I referenced it earlier, but what did you guys think of the big car chase? I was actually really, uh, like, th- that got my attention. And there's a few, like, camera shots in there where it's, like, right on the wheel. Uh, and I was like, ooh, this actually looks pretty good. And then when that other car goes off of the cliff, I rewound. I was like, that that looks real. That's like, okay, that's actually car going off. And it's, the, the camera stays with it the whole time. You see it, like, hit the rocks and go into the water. So I was impressed by that. I liked it, like that it wasn't slick. Like a lot of the James Bond chases of this era, mm-hmm. they're very slickly directed, you know, chase sequences. You know, um, Live and Let Die comes out the same year and that's like really well done, um, you know, car and boat chases. Mm-hmm. But I like that this one was really messy. It's like muddy roads. They're sliding all over the place. It's Paul Newman in kind of a beat up truck being pursued by this white, was it a station wagon or something? It was something like that. Uh, he was... Something like, yeah, some sort, some sort of sedan or something, yeah. Yeah, it's not a sports car. And I like that they're just like, like you know, crashing into stone walls, slipping all over the place. And that it's not like the triumphant, you know, Newman fires a laser out the back of the car <laughs> and takes out the, uh, the Oldsmobile or whatever it is. It's a really like messy, like this car slid down a hill, went off a cliff, and these guys died horribly. <laughs> yeah. Do you know, I, I don't want to poo-poo on something you liked, Cam. Uh-huh. But I think the car chase went on far too long. Ah, uh, I mean, that's fair. I mean, it's one of those things where, you know, you often hear people reference the movie Bullet having one mm-hmm. of the greatest car chases of all time. And then you watch the movie Bullet and you're like, I mean, the pacing of this car chase compared to modern car chases is very slow. So I, I can buy that that maybe in, you know, 1973, this felt a little more propulsive than it does now. But I could kind of go along with it. And I mean, it is the pretty much the sole action moment other than him jumping off the boat. <laughs> um, yeah, that or maybe the prison riot slash escape. Oh, yeah, true. Yeah, that, 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 yeah I'm forgetting that. For, like, in my mind, I guess that, that escape was just so forgettable that I kind of wrote it off. Which, totally fair. Yeah. yeah. Well, okay, I think I've gone through all the characters I really want to touch on. Has anyone else got any main characters they want to talk about? I do for sure, and that is Macintosh. The movie is named after. Okay, that's where I was going to go with. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Um, Harry Andrews plays this character, Macintosh. The movie expects us to invest a lot of meaning into this character because the movie is named after him. 
I have no idea who the Macintosh man is, and his um, relevance to the plot is thin at best. And he dies off screen, too. Like, okay, we see him get hit, but, like, do um, we don't even see him in the coma, do we? No. No, we just hear that he's in a coma, and I'm assuming this is a lot of that, like, all right, you know, we can't, haven't figured out the ending until we're, we're filming it, basically, so... If they had given more time, maybe they would have shown him and give, given us maybe more attachment to him so that we actually care when um, when James Mason says he died hours ago. I think we get one shot of him in the hospital, actually, but it's it's not enough. Yeah, there's a, they give him the paddles in hospital. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yes. But it's so forgettable that, yeah. But then he gets, uh, he gets Remo Williamed. <laughs> it's so weird. Like, was this the right name for this movie? No, no, but I don't know what else you would call. I mean, you wouldn't call this the Reardon Adventure, or I don't know. Off, <laughs> off the boat. Yeah, off the. There you go. I love it. I love it. That's it. Uh, we're, we're changing the name of the episode. It's Off the Boat, <laughs> starring Paul Newman. <laughs> what about something like I don't know, Captive Agent or something? Sure. Hmm. Yeah. I don't know. No. Uh, just Macintosh Man. You go into the movie with a certain amount of. Well, I should really recognize what Macintosh means because that's obviously important, and it's a total non-character, which I think is a not great. Well, the thing is as well, he's not the Macintosh man. True, like he's working for him, but then he's dead, so he's his own guy. Why is he the man? Yeah, I don't know. Like maybe if you added a apostrophe, Macintosh's man. So okay, he's working for Macintosh. I don't know. I would say that, you know, this movie's failure at the box office probably had a little bit to do with the title. I can definitely see that, yeah. And and probably the other thing, which is what I was going to bring up next, which is the ending. Mm-hmm. Now, Cam, you said it was done in the last few days of production when they shot that, I assume, and, and wrote it. Yeah. Uh, I think you can tell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the ending is, uh, I haven't really said it yet, but um, the Dominique Sanders character, Miss Smith, uh, after Paul Newman's character has agreed to let both of the bad guys walk away and everyone just sort of drop guns and walk off, she pulls out a gun and shoots them both to death. Yeah. Uh, very abruptly. It comes out of nowhere. Uh, she's just screaming because, you know, technically they are the responsible for Macintosh's death. Mm-hmm. So I can understand her, her, her rage, but um, it's such an abrupt ending and then it's basically credits. Yeah, I mean, I don't have an issue with her pulling the gun and shooting them because it, you know, throughout it, we're following Paul Newman. We're looking at him to be the decision maker in all these spy caper elements of this film. I kind of like that there's someone who's a peripheral character who's the one that makes the ultimate decisions at the end. I don't have a problem with that because Paul Newman has been manipulated throughout this movie. Um, You know, I I think, I don't know, it's a very confusing (laughs) movie, but it seems like Macintosh is more in control, Wheeler's in control. We find out at the end that maybe Mrs. Smith had more control than Paul Newman did. I'm cool with that. The the moment at the end, though, where he's just kind of like staring at her in horror and walks away feels a little bit like it's cut short. Like it doesn't feel like they quite had a, you know, the proper poetic ending there. Right. And I think maybe if we had seen more of a connection between the two of them, this would mean more to us. Definitely. Definitely. Because, yeah, there's no chemistry between those two whatsoever. So she feels like she could be completely disposable in his life and vice versa. All right, guys. So any, any final thoughts on the film? Cam? Uh, I just had a couple little funny notes I'll make here. Um, number one, I thought the burning mansion shot looked beautiful. Like it was one of those haunting shots that I really appreciated. And that's what a John Houston can deliver in a movie like this that maybe a, you know, cut rate director wouldn't have. Um, the other thing that I actually quite enjoyed when they were going to give Paul Newman, a Canadian identity as a farmer. His name was going to be Raymond Crookshank. <laughs> Is that an average Canadian name? Uh, well, I mean... Oh, turntables. <laughs> <laughs> Crookshank was my mother's maiden name. So. <laughs> Something about Cam Crookshank doesn't just quite work. <laughs> no, it doesn't work. Uh, what about you, Christian? Well, I just remembered about the like random village kids who... Um, Paul Newman gives some money to so that he can uh, be alerted for when that phone goes off. I'm just like, I just are these the only kids in the town? Because the only they're the only ones you see, and we only see one of them come up to like him in the bar. <laughs> and 
I don't know. I wasn't like sometimes kid actors can be dowdy. These ones, well, they didn't say much, so maybe that's why they worked for me. <laughs> yeah, I did actually kind of enjoy that scene um, because of the way he walks into that bar. Like, there was a real sense of place to that mm-hmm. bar, to that pub, um, and um, you know, it, I just thought that it was uh, it had atmosphere. Again, like this movie's pretty good yeah. at atmosphere. That's about it. <laughs> <laughs> Also, that scene is responsible for probably the worst round of uh, cheers I've ever seen. <laughs> oh, okay. It was just like hip hip, right? Hip hip. <laughs> they were matching the energy of this movie. Mm. <laughs> I thought you were going to say James Mason, but uh... oh, that too, that too. <laughs> um, okay. Um, the only bits I had um, was just a small note about uh, Malta. Mm-hmm. They shot that boat scene in the the bay in Valletta, um, and I, I've actually been, uh, I've actually basically stood where they shot one of those shots. Oh, cool! Um, but I just I didn't know until I saw the film. I was like, hey, I've been there. It's a really really <laughs> lovely place, actually. Um, check out Malta if you're ever in that you know, that side of the globe. And did you dive off a boat? <laughs> Uh, no, but I, uh, I, I did shoot someone in a church, but we'll, we'll, we'll cover that later. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah. Um, and the other thing was, I mean, I knew Mrs. Smith was a, was a weirdo before the Tommy Wiseau acting later on <laughs> because she delivered her tea with the milk in. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I'm talking to, uh, uh, yeah, two people I don't think are particularly tea drinkers. No, no. Uh, like James Bond, I hate tea, coffee. <laughs> um, yeah. So when you serve tea, you serve it uh, black, and you provide milk and sugar, so people can choose. So I actually did know that. For, so local in DC is the International Spy Museum, and they have an exhibit on what is her name, uh, Nur Inyat Khan, uh, who was a spy in. Paris in World War was it World War Two, and I think so. She had British a British background, and they actually have this whole exhibit on like, all right, you know, things that the Parisians do that the French do, or that the British do not, and that like when you put in milk is one of them. So I was like, so I remembered it. I just remember which way around it was. I, I can't speak for the French, but uh, yeah, <laughs> we, we we give you the option to put the milk in because sometimes you have Earl Grey and you don't put milk in Earl Grey. Okay. <laughs> so I, as soon as I saw that, it, it's like the old uh, the the red wine with fish mm. <laughs> from from Russia with love. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I, I my, my uh, the hairs in the back of my neck were standing up on that one. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think that's all I've got about the film, guys. Yeah. So I think that brings us to the question: Does the Macintosh Man make the knock list? Christian, what do you think? Oh. Absolutely not. <laughs> I mean, look, I, okay, I didn't exa- I didn't have a bad experience watching the movie, and it was, at least, you know, it l- looked like a movie. There are other movies where, you know, ob- like, the, the filmmaking looks bad, and, you know, but the pacing was off, the story was sort of almost inco- incomprehensible to me, and that's, I, you know, we mentioned at the top that, you know, Mission Impossible was my first spy movie, and that is another film that, is especially if to an 11 year old incomprehensible but there was something that hooked me into that and the fact that you know you if you, you kept we you watched it a number of times you get all the layers where this if you watched it more and more you might like it more but the story is not going to unfold itself mm, yeah I, that's a very solid argument um what about you cam yeah, I'm also a no, but like we've talked about movies in here where I really didn't like them, whether it's Remo Williams or uh, Men in Black 2. Um, this was a movie that I had affection for watching it. It made me want to watch The Life and Times of Judge Roy Bean, which was directed by John Huston and starring Paul Newman. Like, I think these two artists are very interesting. I was hoping this would be kind of a hidden gem that we'd walk away going like, oh, wow, like this is a really great pairing. Maybe not the case with the Macintosh man. It is very messy. As we've said, a lot of weird casting. The plotting is all over the place. It just entirely depends on whether you can kind of be sucked into that 70s, very kind of um, cynical spy mood. And again, this is done way better in Three Days of the Condor, which starred Newman's frequent collaborator, Robert Redford. Like that's an infinitely better movie. That's one that's on the knock list. 
this is just kind of going for a similar type of energy. It just doesn't have any of the creative elements in place to really make it something that's particularly good or great. I just found it kind of sucked me in with its vibe, but I don't think many people will share my opinion on this one. So it's a no. <laughs> Again, I think a very valid opinion. I'm I'm going to go with a no as well, even though it doesn't make a difference because there've already been two no's. <laughs> I but I completely get the vibe. I I feel like I feel like with a little bit more work, this could have been a really good film. Yeah, and I think you know we've had movies that were bad that weren't necessarily the most riveting to talk about. Like I think this movie actually had a lot to delve into, so that is a point in its favor in my mind. I, I would sooner revisit this than you know Remo or Men in Black Two. <laughs> mm-hmm. and that and, and that says a lot really because it, it hasn't made the knock list that's fine yeah but it was an enjoyable watch and we all took something from it sure yeah uh, and now i'm gonna go jump off a boat <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna rethink my opinions on james mason <laughs> <laughs> well there we go the macintosh man is not making the knock list and as such the dossier on the film is complete and filed as classified so cam what are we doing next week Well, Scott, we are jumping from 1973 to 1966 to hang out with James Coburn in the original Our Man Flint. I have never, ever seen these films, but I I never stop hearing about them. Ooh, you're in for a treat. Uh, We will be covering the second film of that series in our uh, 60s Swinging Spy Summer, so... Once you once you listen to that, well, whenever arcs come out, tune in for part. I guess the sixth sequel to it. Well, there you go. And how do people check out your podcast? So it's available on most podcast streams. Uh, you can find us. Um, the website is the dash spy dash fi fi dash guys dot castos dot com, or you can just find us on social media at the spy fi guys Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And you guys are available wherever podcasts are available, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, we're we're all spy bros here. There's there's, you know, there's only a couple, a handful of us spy movie podcasts out there, and we don't tip our hat to many of them. But Spy Fi guys get our thumbs up. So if you love Spy Hards, check out the Spy Fi guys for sure. Perfect. So make sure you watch Our Man Flint and join us next week. Uh, you can, of course, find the knock list at letterbox.com slash spyhards. And you can, of course, follow us discreetly on social media at spyhards. That's S-P-Y-H-A-R-D-S on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. But until next week, listeners, fair dinkum, governor. Governor.